Good evening, everybody out there in uh, webinar land. It's uh, my name is David Entwistle. Uh, I'm the chairman of the IMACE Aerospace Northwest Committee, and tonight so uh, we're going to bring you some really exciting content around drones. Um, so this is around demining in Cambodia and the application of using drones to clear landmines. Um, this is being taken by Professor Darren Ansel. Uh, aerospace engineering leader at University of Central Lancashire and at, at UCLan, Darren is a leading member of UAV research project, projects developing autonomous intelligent software for all aerospace industry. He has led drone projects in fields of industrial inspection, search and rescue, landmine clearance, agriculture, swarming, novel materials, air quality, toxicity measurements and the use of drones in cities so it's uh, quite quite topical at the moment a lot of focus around uh, drone usage out there and the applications and uh, so this seminar I'll hand over to Darren shortly but uh, through Rai Rulan will be taking any questions and answers uh, taking any questions and we'll, we'll give you the answers after the after the presentation which should, should last about 45 minutes so uh so anyway over to darren uh thanks for doing this darren so let's take it, take it away welcome thank you dave i'll just share my screen so hopefully you can see those slides now let me just uh i can switch my camera back on i believe and then i'll pop up in the corner there we go that's it there we go okay so yeah thanks for the introduction dave uh, evening everyone so I, as dave said i'm, I'm darren ansel i'm a prophet you clan um i'm going to be talking to you tonight about um a research project i've been involved in now for about five years so this is all about the the task of uh, landmine uh, detection and clearance uh we've been focusing a lot of our efforts on on the challenges in Cambodia for various reasons that I'll explain shortly. Um, plan for this evening, I'm, I'm going to just, just start, just introduce UCLan to you for a couple of minutes because I know not all of you will be familiar with UCLan and those of you that are, it's, it's changed a lot in the last couple of years. I uh, just want to tell you a little bit about some of the drone activities we've been doing at, uh, at UCLan that sort of led up to us being able to do this kind of work. And I'm going to take you through the all the sort of research projects and activities we've been doing over the last five years in 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 de mining. Uh, we've we've been trying all kinds of drone technologies out. So um, hopefully you'll find this quite interesting. Um, so those of you that don't know UCLan, we're we're based in Preston, University of Central Lancashire. We're often mixed up with uh, with um, Lancaster University. Um, but we're completely different. They're, they're 20 miles north of us up the road. Um, if you ever get to this bit of Preston, it's changed an awful lot in the last couple of years because we're we're actually investing a huge amount of money on campus. We've part of a 200 million pound campus master plan at the moment that's putting new buildings up. It's creating a new civic square, um, and um, that building on the left there, the black building, that's our new engineering innovation centre. Uh, that, that was the first real big building to go up as part of this master plan opened a couple of years ago and that's our um that, that's home to all the aerospace work that i do we have some aerospace workshops in there and some pretty sophisticated flight simulation capability in there as well so yeah um come and have a look around campus sometime you'll always be welcome and it's a large university as well we're, we're actually up approaching 38,000 now staff and students and there's about two and a half thousand of those of staff so we're about the sixth biggest university in the UK based on those numbers. When I first joined UCLan um, around about 2012 we didn't do aerospace at UCLan uh, my job was to build it up and to to grow it and uh, that was to kick off research uh, but also business engagement and um, the teaching of aerospace uh, as a subject at the university so we started off doing some um, drone projects um, to get us going. We, we did a, a drone search and rescue mission back in 2013, just to prove how useful drones would be for, for search and rescue. We created a drone research center. Um, 
we started experimenting with materials that, that image you can see in the background there was a graphene enhanced wing that's a carbon fiber wing that has graphene uh, impregnated impregnated into it that improved the strength and reduced the weight and we actually flew and operated that at the Farnborough Air Show so from a sort of standing start within just a few years we were actually flying at, uh, at Farnborough which was quite exciting as well as the technology side we've been pushing at the promotion and the use of drones, civic drones for civil purposes. Um, we got involved in a big national study called Flying High, which was looking at drone use cases across the country. Uh, we built another graphene aircraft called Juno. That's all graphene enhanced materials. And again, took that back to Farnborough. Um, we're involved in European programs, try to promote drone use. Uh, but a couple of big things have happened in the last year. So even during lockdown, we've been managing to move forward with this. We've, we've got a huge equipment grant in 2020 to support drone businesses in Lancashire. So we've been investing in all kinds of equipment. And that's actually helped us to take some of this landmine research forward as well. We built a prototype drone for the fire service last year. And we just launched a, a business support program that's going to run for two years to support small and medium sized enterprises, help them to innovate with drone technology and also sort of use it in their businesses. And we just started another small um, project uh, to develop some drone collision avoidance technology as well. So we're doing a lot in this field. And um, you might wonder how we ended up doing landmines. Um, th there's a funny story to this. Um, we There's a Burnley based charity called Furniture for Education Worldwide. Uh, if any of you from BAE at Wharton, you might recognize Phil Crow there. He's one of the, the trustees. And uh, Furniture for Education, what they do, they, they, they sort of collect unwanted office furniture. So you're probably familiar when corporate uh, decide that they don't want that color chair anymore. It normally goes to landfill or, uh, you know, it's just, just disposed of. So FEW, they, they go around, they collect all the unwanted furniture, they send it around the world, they, they send it to Africa, Zanzibar, Pakistan there, um, and they, they set up schools with it. Uh, so it's a real, real active charity. They've, they've sent hundreds of containers now. Um, it's actually run by Terry Burns. He, he's the ex-leader of Lancashire County Council. Um, now, one of the containers they actually sent to Cambodia, and their host in the country was that chap in the corner, um, Lieutenant General Ken Sorsavon. He's he's a two-star general in the National Peacekeeping Force in in Cambodia, and they they're actually involved with landmine and uh, unexploded remnants of war clearance. Um, and he asked the charities or anything they could do to help with the landmine situation out there. Um, could they raise any funds? Is there anything they could do to help? And that's when we got the call and um, we started thinking, well, I wonder what, what technology we can do. What, what could we do to sort of help here? So we we actually been working with FEW most of the, through most of this journey over the last few years in in trying to sort of promote and use drones to, to help with, with demining in, in the country. Let's tell you a bit about Cambodia. Um, I don't know how many of you have been there. Um, if you've been to Thailand, which is probably more common place to visit, Cambodia is about, it feels like it's about 20 or 30 years behind Thailand, even though the, the sort of neighboring countries. And it's because it's just had decades of, of turmoil and war. Um, it's had, it's been bombed to bits because of Vietnam. Um, it's had civil wars, the Khmer Rouge, um, you know, the genocide in the country for, for decades, um, Vietnamese invasion, and it's had this terrible legacy of, of being a, a war zone for such a long time. And, and that's resulted in a lot of um, unexploded ordnance and landmines being left in the country. Just to give you an example, if, if you think, look back on World War II and US bombs dropped on Japan, um, in that sort of four-year period, they dropped 160,000 tons of bombs on in in, in World War Two. Um, in Cambodia, and they weren't even at war with Cambodia; they were at war with Viet Vietnam, of course. Um, they still dropped nearly three and a half times that amount of ordnance on Cambodia to try and um, disrupt some of the Vietnamese supply lines and 
so the the country is, is absolutely you know it's had to deal with all of that for for many many years now and it's it's left that legacy where there's patches of the country um i'll give you some of the figures shortly but um landmines that the fenced off you can't use them there's unexploded ordnance in trees um that it's underground there's landmines everywhere and and it's a real real challenge um and as a country they have to rely on sort of charitable donations uh from other countries to help help get the mines out of the ground now the mines themselves they, they come from all over the world you see there's been so many different uh, act uh, you know events over the years different different armies planting them um they 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 take all kinds of shapes and sizes so you've got you've got metallic ones you've got plastic ones you can you have wooden ones uh you get the anti-personnel type ones that are the smaller ones and then you get the the slightly larger anti-tank mines as well <clears throat> and of course they're, they're difficult to detect they're underground to start with so how do you go about finding them and detecting them um some some are made of metal so obviously metal detection is is one way of doing that and that's the the main sort of technology main sort of sensor that's still used today um but once people realized that you can use uh, metal de metal detectors to detect them they started reducing the amount of metal in the mines to make them harder and harder to detect so it's a real real challenge just just being able to you know be able to be able to detect these um real, real real old challenge some of them have like a little pressure plate on the top and they're intended to be sort of buried just a few centimeters below the surface um and the horrible thing about them is they're not designed to kill either they're designed to maim because what they want to do is slow an advancing army down so the idea is if you've injured a soldier the rest of the 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 crew have to carry them and slows them down and weakens them as a whole so they're really quite horrific devices um and another way that they, they, they started arming these to sort of prevent them being detected was bury them deeper but then put some kind of uh, remote trigger which can be just a you know something like a bamboo stick um uh, just buried beneath the soil and again very very difficult to detect then so it's a real real technical challenge as well as being a, a you know a horrible humanitarian problem they're the sort of anti-tank mines much bigger they require a lot more pressure but they tend to be you know on the surface or very close to the surface a bit easier to detect as well so how do they get mines out of the ground at the moment well well the main the main method is actually human effort and it's painstaking and slow and dangerous I mean, um, typically the only tools they have are a metal detector and uh, a probe, some, something to actually prod the ground with. So it's a it's a highly risky game, very, very slow to, to make progress as well. Um, many of the non-government organisations that actually do demining around the world, um, they don't seem to invest in much technology. They seem to go down a model of employing local people, providing jobs. So it's a double-edged sword. They're, they're getting a, you know, they're they're getting an income and a career. Uh, it's helping them to support the families, but at the same time, they're doing this really sort of dangerous, dangerous job. And there's got to be better ways to do it. You you probably can't solve the whole problem, but you can either make it safer or you can speed up the rate at which mines are coming out of the ground. People have looked at all kinds of methods. I mean, rats are, uh, believe it or not, are, can be trained to detect the explosives. Um, some, rats, uh, some rats make a nice career out of it. Um, but they can be crafty. They can actually learn that they're going to be rewarded if they re respond in a certain way. Um, so they can't be 100% reliable, but the, there's some pretty effective um, rat teams that are used. And, they, and there is a team of them in Cam Cambodia as well. Um, the more traditional method will be dogs, of course. They've got that fabulous nose and they can smell the explosives. So they can actually go around the minefields and they can they can look at, uh, um, you know, you can just look for the response. But you can just see the physical challenges you've got. You've got trees, you've got bushes. Um, the, the 
even the best will in the world, you're not going to be able to explore all of the minefield. It's a it's a real physical challenge as well as that, you know, the actual challenge of detecting the mines themselves. Quite often, what they've got to do is, is clear an area, you know, cut, cut the grass and cut the bushes and trees out of the way, and that's dangerous in itself. We've also, come across uh, bees being used for this as well. So, um, similar to the rats, they can be trained, and they, you can train them on a reward system. So if you can get them to attract to sort of explosive chemicals, um, there's been research where they've been rewarded with like a sugar syrup, and, uh, and that's that's an active field of research still today. So Cambodia, just to give you an idea of how, how big a problem this still is, there's about 400 square kilometres that are still um, fenced off and unusable, and this is because they're seen as high risk areas. Um, and the progress is slow. I mean, Cambodia has a target to be landmine free by 2025. But but you can see in the last couple of years, they've only actually, they're taking about 20, 21 kilometres out of the ground, um, you know, land release each year. So, you know, at that rate, it's going to take another 20 years at least to, to get them all out of the ground. And the whole point of this is land release, so it can be used for farming or development and, you know, try to, you know, boost the economy, give people jobs and allow them to, to use that land. In, in Cambodia, all, all of the demining is overseen by an organisation called the CMAA. They're the Countermine Action and Victim Assistance Authority. So they're, that's actually run by the um, Deputy Prime Minister of Cambodia. Um, and uh, they they support all of the demining charities and the Cambodian demining groups, uh, helping plan where to go next, what what needs to be done. Um, I'll tell you a bit more about them uh, later because we we've been uh, working with those quite carefully. But you can see see the scale of the problem there, how big it is, and how how slow it it's actually progressing. <laughs> So back to drones then. So how how have uh, drones been used? Well, when I first started looking at this about five years ago, this kind of concept was, I think this was on Kickstarter. Um, someone wanted to build a drone that could map an area, detect drones, and then detonate them as well. I think it didn't really go anywhere, this. And I think when you, when you hear my rest of the presentation, you'll see why it's, it's an extremely difficult, challenging problem. First of all, it's a, it's a detection side that is the real challenge here um, and it's um, it's not an easy easy one to do so we first first went over to Cambodia this was working with the FEW charity I mentioned earlier in uh, 2016 and uh, the intention there was to go and work with some of the demining teams in this in the first instance we worked with the army and we wanted to just introduce them to drones. We recognised we couldn't do everything at that point, but we thought we'll show them that what you can do today and see how they could integrate that into their demining processes, which either improve the data they're getting or the speed that they're, they're doing it. So we, we talked to the Army General um, and we said, can we visit a landmine site? Um, can we have some data on it, what you know about it? And we'll survey it with the drone. Um, so the first thing they give us was this drawing of one of the, the minefields. And, and that is the sort of quality of survey data that they have. You know, it's, it's gridded paper. It's It's got a coordinate system that don't make a lot of sense. When I Certainly when I translated those into latitudes and longitudes, they, they were all wrong when we actually got to the site. And uh, and that's the sort of survey grade data that they have. You know, it's, uh, it's quite primitive. Um, they took us up into uh, Persat province, which is sort of center of uh, Cambodia. And this data came from the CMAA and you can see certain areas around there where the, you know, the hotspot areas are fenced off. Um, and they weren't particularly large, but they were still, you know, there were key places like the school playing field, you know, really, really disruptive, the fact that, that they were still there. Um, and we and we took a surveying drone over there and we we, we were going to uh, map the area but there was another technique that we were interested in as well um 
and it's to do with how you can use cameras on drones for agricultural purposes. Now, I don't know if you know, but um, you can fly over uh, a field and if you look at that that field with a, a near infrared camera uh, and then do a pretty simple post processing sum on, on what the pixel data is telling you, um, you can work out how healthy the plants are in that field. Uh, so it's called um, um, normalized digital vegetation indexing. So it's very easy to do. It's as easy as taking a photograph. And the reason it works is um, in the sort of near infrared and infrared spectrum, um, healthy plants tend to reflect infrared energy a lot better than unhealthy plants. Um, and that's visible in an image. So what's that got to do with landmines? Well, landmines tend to leak. They're in, under the ground for decades sometimes and the chemicals can leak out of them and they can actually poison the, the plants that are growing above. Um, so if you actually survey a field and uh, there's areas that look unhealthy, it's an indication that there could be something there. It's not going to detect directly, but it could actually give you a prompt and it's quite it's better to have that extra information if you can get it sort of thing you'll get is like, like the image on the left there you get like a heat map and you can see the healthy and the unhealthy regions as as they are color coded that's another one i did that was an image we did we did up in scotland actually for a completely different uh, purpose but you could see you can see things like where, where water is and rocks um and clear clear differences in the vegetation health as well so we thought we'd try that over the minefield because we were flying there anyway. Uh, so we did a normal uh, photographic um, map of it. And we also did this this uh, vegetation indexing as well. And it, it's really interesting because you do see features in the image that you just would not see with a normal camera. And they're all areas that you could then go and investigate. Um, that was the drone we used for this at the time. That was a, it was called a Sense Flight. It's a mapping drone. I can fly for about 45 minutes um, so you can put a standard camera in it or you can put that near infrared camera in it to do do the vegetation indexing as well and it was really to show you know show the the command clearance team there how how you could use this for for your surveying and your planning when you're approaching an area um, because of course you can map um, it creates maps so it's a hand launched drone it'll fly for about 45 minutes it's taking still images as it as it flies along and then you put the images into a photo photogrammetry package which stitches them all together and it creates a georeference map so you can click on any pixel and get the coordinates of it and you can take measurements from it um, you can do more processing and create a um a 3d map if you want to do that um so we were show, just demonstrating all those techniques i mean that was one of the big aerial maps that, that we made with it it's hard to see here, but in the photogrammetry tool, you can get the topology, you can you can take measurements, um, there's, there's so much you can do with it. And then if you wanted to actually plot out the minefield there within that, that image, you can do that. And it's really quite high resolution as well. It was a few hundred feet in the air there, so you're well out of any danger. You don't have to go into the minefield, you can send the drone in to do the, you know, the dangerous stuff. Um, the other idea I had, I had a really smart guy working for me. In fact, he's still working for me because he's so good. He, uh, about a month before we went on this trip, I said, give him a challenge. And I said, if we spot anything from the air with a drone, I'd like a little uh, remote control metal detector that we can drive in and then sweep the area. And he come up with this within a few weeks, which was a brilliant job. And it's GPS guided, so we can take the data from the image feed it into, into this little rover and, not, and off it goes to um, to scan the area. So we left that with the Cambodians. So they, they've been using that for the last few years. We also did a bit of training while we was there. So that's one of my colleagues from the university. And we, we actually went to teach uh, people how to fly drones and use them because it's no good us just going and doing the doing our demos and then, then going home. Uh, we wanted to sort of leave them with the skills to do this as well. Um, so we raised some money with with the again with FEW, and um, we were able to supply them with four four drones, four quadcopters, surveying drones, all the laptops and everything they needed to be able to do that. So that that was the first first sort of bit of uh, I suppose bit of impact that we made there. 
then it was difficult for the next few years it was difficult getting any funding or you know just having the opportunity to go back but we did um, a couple of years later we went back we did more training this this time but with a much better drone because the technology was progressing so much more quickly um, and we again we, we donated more drones and we um, and we were able to show them mapping techniques we, we set up exercises where we hid things in fields and the team had to go out and locate them using the drones and, and again they've integrated that now into part of their demining process which is which is great um all of those guys about three days we did classroom sort of theory all the sort of aviation theory the sort of thing a commercial drone pilot would would do in this country and then and then some practical training where they were learning how to fly and doing all these exercises um they all did really good really really well the other thing we did that was important that year, um, 2019, was 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 to create an MOU with the the, camp, the mine um, action authority, uh, and that's uh, His Excellency Lee Tuck. He's the deputy uh, prime minister, and he leads that that actual agency. And we signed an MOU with them to sort of help them for the next few years to with drone technology, and to uh, they're giving us sort of expertise from their, their own demining people and access to data and access to test sites. And uh, and we were working on the technology side with them. So the next thing was what what can, what else can we do? So um, we needed to look at other kinds of technology. Um, what else can we put on a drone? So we've looked at infrared, we've looked at visible band. Uh, there's another technique uh, using thermal imagery um where you can try to detect differences in the way that the land heats up so if you put dissimilar objects on the ground and just left them through the night they'd obviously cool to a similar temperature but as the as the as they warm up throughout the day they're going to heat up at different rates and that can be visible on a thermal imager so we wanted to find somewhere where you know we could actually test this idea out um, so we built a drone with um, a thermal imager on it. We also had the other sensors we've used. So we had, I think we had three cameras attached to this particular drone. Um, and we, we found a test site out in Croatia and it's got about eight of these one meter, light, one meter wide by about 20 meter long um, sort of pathways there with all different kinds of mines. They've been buried in there since the 1980s. So they've been there a long time. And we we're able to test our system there um just literally fly over you're getting this kind of thermal imagery so you know you can see differences uh, that's not actually one of my images but that's just to show the the example of how different objects can be seen on the, on the cameras um so again it was a quadcopter drone uh, with a downward facing set of sensors um it was interesting we had mixed results we we, we knew the vegetation indexing wouldn't work here because the mines were all disarmed so there was no chemicals to leak into the ground and affect the way the plants were, were growing but the thermal was interesting they did have some surface mines some of the um, anti-tank mines that were very close to the surface and we could see them on the thermal imager quite easily some of the other data was a bit more ambiguous but we learned a little bit by doing that um that was just one of the trials from the days incidentally that the guy that met us there and hosted us was one of the professors in croatia that's doing the bee research to detect mines now we we went back to cambodia last year and we did um another another set of meetings and workshops with them um again keeping an open mind this time but more about learning about the challenges around demining just to see if there was anything else that we could go back to the uni and think about and maybe invent something or build a prototype of some kind. Uh, we managed to get out there sort of February time just before pandemic last year. Uh, again, working with demining guys, asking them about what where are the challenges, uh, getting feedback on the drone technology that they'd used. So we did we did some sort of workshop activities with them. Um, but one of the other important things there was to think about how we go about testing new technology we, we, we there's not a lot you can do in the uk really um croatia was quite expensive as well to go there um so we made some contacts um 
one of the one of the chaps we 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 made a contact with was uh this guy bill uh bill morse now bill's uh bill retired he lived in the states and he, he retired and him and his wife went out to cambodia and set up a charity and it was to raise funds for one of the the mining charities out there and they've raised an awful lot of money over that over the time i'm just going to there's a documentary all about Bill and the next guy I'm going to tell you about. Um, it's called Until They're Gone. I was looking for it the other day. It used to be on uh, on Amazon. It's not there anymore. But if you've heard of a, uh, a streaming provider called Plex, it's free on there. And it's a really good documentary that really urge you to go and watch that. Um, but like Bill says there, it's a, it's a massive problem. Five million landmines in the ground with no idea where they are. And often they were laid, laid by boy soldiers, Camer Rouge. Um, now, Bill spends some time at the Landmine Museum talking about um, landmines. It's up in Siem Reap in the north of Cambodia. And the, the reason Bill went out there was because of uh, this man, Aki Ra. Now, Aki Ra was a Camer Rouge boy soldier. He put a lot of mines in the ground. He had no choice. They would have killed him if, if he didn't. Um, and he, he was an expert in planting them, of course. But then when the Vietnamese uh, liberated Cambodia, he joined the Vietnamese army and started demining. Um, then he did some work with the United Nations doing more. And then he created his own charity, the Cambodian Self-Help Demining Group. And he's just spending his life now pulling mines out of the ground. He, uh, he won a major award. 2010, he was CNN Hero of the Year. Um, but Bill has been raising money for Akira's charity. And I mentioned the Landmine Museum, and we, we were talking to Bill and saying, in that documentary, he actually said, what we need is a radar. We need a radar on a drone to be able to detect these buried landmines. So I um, I thought, right, we're going to get you one, and we're going to try it. Um, through talking to Bill and Aki, we, we, we went round the Landmine Museum. We, we had a look at all the everything they've got there you lots of unexplored well shell everything's safe of course these days they're, they're, they're all disarmed but they've got everything that you could possibly find in the ground in cambodia in this this particular landmine museum so lots of unexploded ordnance that you'd find there's landmines of every type from every country in the world that they've pulled out of the ground there <clears throat> and the plan was the back of the landmine museum has it's quite a bit of land there and we were going to create a, our own test site. We were going to bury all kinds of the common types of mines in the in this test site. And I, I was going to work on some technology back at the university to take out there. Um, and then, of course, we had lockdown. So last year, couldn't really make much progress with it. So over the last year, I did mention that equipment grant we got. I was able to start specking and researching and buying lots and lots of drone equipment. So we spent most of the last year investing in equipment. And it's only in this, these last few weeks we've been able to unbox it and start learning how to use it. Um, so we didn't go to Cambodia, even though we had funding to do it uh, because of because of those travel restrictions. And we need, needed to find a place in the UK where we could actually go and test out some new technology. Um, Funny enough, uh, a colleague has a friend who has a farm in Swansea. Um, and we also know some surveying experts down there, one of them who's a, an expert in ground penetrating radar. So it all came together really nicely. And I, I've actually just completed this trip. I actually got home about an hour and a half ago. So I've got some hot off the press test data to show you and just tell you what we've been up to down there. Um, Bill said he wanted a ground penetrating radar. so. We bought one and it's um, it's mounted on a hexacopter. Uh, so normally the, the system on the left is how you'd normally do a ground penetrating radar survey. You would um, push it along on a trolley. Um, with the drone, of course, you don't need to be in contact with the ground. So it's got all kinds of um, advantages really. Um, and we're just trying to learn it, how to use it. Is it. How good is it? Is It's not designed for landmine detection. It's designed for sort of the utilities in construction sector, you know, for sort of discovering buried pipes and cables, um, that kind of thing. So we were really pushing it over the last few days just to learn about it and see how, how effective it could be. 
we actually bought it not for the landmine work but for some of the other projects we're doing um but we're really excited to try it and it's actually for the for the techies out there it's it's actually got three antennas in it so it's really quite a wide band bandwidth system and for ground penetrating radar surveys the the low frequency end gives you all the depth so if you need to see a long way underground you you know you'd use the low sort of frequency antennas but if you want to detect closer to the surface with sort of higher resolution you need higher frequencies and this one does on certainly in terms of the manufacturer data have a really quite wide bandwidth so we we thought we'll, we'll give it a go so um the way we do this we use that drone with the radar and we use a mission planning tool and we actually create a survey area you can sort of see an example one there where you almost race track back and forth over the the area that you want to survey you have to make really quite narrow um, passes because the the beam width for the antenna is, is quite narrow so you, you, you're flying back sort of half a meter in between each sort of pathway um and there's a data logger on the drone recording all of the the ground penetrating radar data as, as you go through the survey um we manufactured some test objects so you see different sort of mine like uh dummy mines there we had metal ones wooden ones different shapes different materials sort of aluminium and uh steel i think we took some big objects we were trying to find something that would represent an anti-tank mine and the closest thing we could find was a um was a car brake disc so we took that buried that uh that that was one with just a almost like a, a trigger type uh representation on the top and just for this first trial we, we didn't go too deep we went about 30 centimeters down because we thought if we can't see them at 30 centimeters we're not going to be able to see them at you know much deeper depths than that um and and that was the drone that was part of the trials we've just done over the last couple of days um i haven't even got all the results to show you yet because i'm literally still on my laptop um this this was when we were first testing the drone um it does have a has a radar altimeter on it so that we can do terrain following it's one of the things we've learned over the last few days is it's really important to keep the radar the distance between the radar and the ground as constant as possible uh you wouldn't even fly that high you want to be flying probably between 50 centimeters to a meter off the ground when you do this um well it's just a little clip of the drone and see it flies along pretty fast you're looking at about one meter per second it's actually doing that sort of race track effect there where you created a survey area drone spins around does the next leg we can get about 20 minutes flight time the sort of data we're getting back uh, just to give you an example uh, when when you first see it as it's logging in real time you're getting this sort of 2d plot and what we're looking for is these sort of reflections um you know that that's your indication of of your buried objects they don't look like this when you first get the data you've got to do quite a bit of filtering to it um so we've got about 30 flights worth of data from the last couple of days and we're starting to go through all that now against the different test objects that, that we buried so hopefully we'll have a real initial proof of concept here and and we can start taking that forward we are going back in a few weeks time because we haven't been able to test everything that we that we wanted to do um so when we when we return in a couple of weeks we've got a few other ground penetrating radars slightly different frequencies uh, so we're going to try try those as well they'll give you much more depth and probably be useful for the unexploded ordinance detection more than the the landmine detection but we're quite excited about trying those um but one other piece of kit that we think could be pretty game changing here is a uh, an actual airborne magnetometer so we bought one of these and this is um this is uh it has five flux sensors in it and you can get 25 centimeter resolution um again it's really lightweight fly it on the drone just the same way you'd fly the radar 
And of course, if there, if there are metallic objects underground, you've got a real good chance of being able to see them with this kind of system. So uh, we, we, we literally didn't have time to do that this weekend. But when we go back in a few weeks time, we're going to we're going to test that one as well. And what we're hoping is that all these sensors, when you put all the data sets together, you can grow your confidence about actually detecting the 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 mines in the ground because i don't think any one of them on their own is got is going to give you the full picture but if you could survey an area with four or five different sensors and then fuse the data then you've got a real a real good chance just going forward um one of my colleagues is is looking at elect sort of electronic noses that kind of technology olfactory sensors are called uh, very interested in seeing whether they can create something that detects chemicals um one of the challenges here is that you know the it's very very low levels that you've got to try and detect so you need a really really sort of sensitive system but that's something that maybe might happen in the future and just be an extra sort of sensor to, to add to the package and, and ultimately we we just want to be able to use the drone right the way through and maybe ground robotics too so you know use the different types of sensors do the survey in first do these the sort of uh, you know the gas sensing with the drone? Do the ground penetrating radar? Look at your all your various optical sensors, and then maybe send some kind of ground vehicle in to do extra extra surveying or de even the the detonation. At the moment, they, they tend to put small explosive charges on the sites once they're discovered, and then remotely detonate them. Um, it's it is. It's not the best way to do it because they're trying to recover the land and they don't want all the shrapnel and or chemicals spreading over the land um so it's always best if you can extract it in one piece and then then sort of disarm it somewhere else um but as you can see quite passionate about this I, I want to try and make a difference in this area i think we've got all kinds of great technology now to do this it's just difficult making fast progress with it it's uh this is sort of an extra project that we're doing alongside everything else. Um, but we, we're making the best use of the equipment we've got to, to try and progress this and uh, hopefully we can make a difference. And I think I'm about just a couple of minutes over. So hopefully that's, uh, that's just gonna lead us nicely into our questions. Thanks for listening. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Darren. Um, I I hope uh, can can you hear me? Just to make sure. Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Darren, for that absolutely splendid um, presentation. Uh, can I invite uh, questions uh, from the audience? Right. I got uh, the first uh, question. Uh, it's uh, from uh, Joachim Neff. Um, it's uh, Rappingi Limited mechatronics engineer uh, mm. how do you recover a mine without it being triggered very carefully <laughs> is the answer um i showed you that's uh, that picture of a d miner at work and it is literally an excavation um they they work very very slowly and carefully to to take the land away from around the drone uh, around the mine sorry um the I've seen some videos of Aki Ra at work and he, he knows the, the technology inside out and he knows where to hold them and how to de deactivate them. Some of them have deactivation pins on the side. Um, but yeah, generally it's a really, really sort of careful, slow thing to do. Um, I say when, if they can avoid detonating them, it's better to do that. Um, when Aki Ra first started demining, he got into trouble because he was he was taking them all apart by hand because he was so skilled he could do that uh, but of course all the he was building up a big stockpile of explosives that the cambodian government wasn't very happy about so he had to uh i think he got a health, health and safety telling off and had to follow a lot of processes to actually um do that in the end but he got all licensed and does it all properly now <laughs> The uh, next question I have is uh, from uh, Andrew Maxwell, uh, who's a student. Uh, is it possible to visit UCLan at the moment? It is. Um, I don't know whether you're a current student or thinking of applying, but um, we do have quite a few open days. Um, the, the, the 
there was an open day plan for this month, but it's had to move to a virtual event at the moment for obvious reasons. But we do do um, we do short tours for for uh, potential students and the families. At the moment, you can book them. Uh, if if you're wanting to come and have a look on campus and look around, just contact our admissions team. You'll find all the links on the on the UCLan website there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, are there any uh, further questions from? Okay, just uh, a couple more. One of them is from uh, uh, Nathan Buksh, uh, is Harbor Energy uh, Senior Completions Engineer. Hi, I think that the work you're doing is absolutely wonderful and you're definitely making an extremely positive difference. Is there any way to contribute to your campaign and or follow your progress? That's that's really kind. Thank you uh, for that, Nathan. Um, we're pretty bad, actually, at talking about this. <laughs> so um, we we do put stories out on our, you know, on our UCLan channels occasionally. Um, but I would suggest you get in touch personally. Um, I've got your email there. I'll, I'll drop you a line and then I'll, next time we're doing a, any kind of activities we'll we'll keep you in the loop and you you know you you're welcome to get involved the more the more help the better so thank you for that thank you and uh, the next one i have a uh, comment uh, uh, from uh, joachim neff again uh, sorry i missed uh, parts of the presentation and obviously the bit about the d minor amazing work anyway congratulations and best of luck if I have some promising ideas that could help you, I will get in touch. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, um, I think ev ev anything and everything is is valuable, I think. Um, I could say there's not a lot of technology that seems to be emerging in this field. Um, and there seems to be a reluctance as well in the in the current demining groups to adopt new technology because of the way they've been working some of those reasons i mentioned about the way that they sort of employ local people to do the work that's that's their model and that's how they operate and um, so i always think you know there's a better way to do these things so anything that can help is uh is really sort of important thank you thank you and uh uh, I, uh, the next one is from uh, David White uh, from uh, Harper Adams University. He's a senior lecturer in engineering. Fascinating presentation. Thinking about NDVI, I did hear a few years ago that somebody had produced a plant that changed color in the presence of a leaking landmine. If that is true, you could use an RGB camera. Yeah, absolutely. I've forgotten about that. Yeah. Um... They did some kind of, you know, uh, selective breeding or whatever they call it, the horticulturists. <laughs> and yeah, it, 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 there was something about, I think it might be, there's a lot of nitrogen in TNT, obviously. So I think that can do something to the chemistry and the, the, they were able to, to uh, make the, the plant grow in a different colour. So yeah, really, really good idea. And again, some of these solutions you don't have to have an instant sensor but that that could be quite a cheap and easy way to do it and you've got that really visible warning as well there which is a really really nice elegant way to do it yeah thank you uh, at this point uh, i would like to use my privilege and uh, ask uh, a question of my own um you mentioned about the fact that uh, the um, land warms up at different rates after sunrise mm. uh, if if you have landmines present uh, will it result in uh, the that part that patch warming a little bit faster than the its neighboring patch it can be faster or slower it depends okay. on the materials and it depends on you know what they're buried in as well so obviously if it's wet you know damps soils they're gonna have a different sort of thermal uh properties to um sort of dry sand for example um so really you're just looking for a difference you're looking for something that's either hotter or colder yeah thank you yeah. just uh one other question from me you, uh, you said that um with um i was quite fascinated with this airborne ground penetrating mm -hmm. radar 
uh, seems somewhat contradictory, but it's fascinating technology. Uh, when you say uh, it can uh, penetrate, uh, the, the low frequency can go deeper underground. Yeah. Uh, what sort of typical depths are we, or depth, range of depths are we talking about, please? Okay, so the very, the lower frequency systems, the ones that perhaps operate around 200 megahertz, um, they can go hundreds of meters underground. Good, good. Yeah. Um, again, it depends on the medium that, you, that you're going through. You have to have some kind of knowledge about that in advance. But they've been used in, say, the Arctic for measuring depths of sheet ice. Um, I've seen that system flown on a helicopter uh, for that kind of purpose i think that was originally what it was designed for uh, but you can you can actually get hundreds of meters they, they discovered a a crashed uh world war ii fighter plane in about 200 meters of snow and ice with, with mm. that system um, and i've seen a group take um take one of these corpus systems that we have um it was a research group in the philippines i believe they actually excavated a huge, um, you know, they created a huge hole, sort of swimming pool sized, um, and put put um, a, a sort of, obviously a safe, but uh, full size uh, a bomb in it. And then we covered it, and they were able to detect that with the system quite easily. Uh, you can even create three D maps now using that. So it's uh, got a lot of potential, I think. And the price is starting to come down. I mean, our system was quite expensive. You're looking £25,000 to buy that. And it's not optimised for the shallow depths and small objects. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, it wouldn't, you know, that the technology is there to do it now. So you could actually perhaps make a bit more simple system that worked really effectively, just say up to a metre underground. I think, I think that the, there could be a gap in the market for something like that. Thank you very much, uh, Darren. Um, at this point, uh, I would uh, just like to wrap things up by uh, saying a few words. First of all, you uh, started by um, uh, looking at the history of how you and your team got uh, involved. That itself was uh, quite enlightening. Mm -hmm. And um, I had no idea that there was such a bewildering variety of uh, landmines. Uh, that uh, was, yeah. <laughs> in some ways, was a real eye-opener for me. And uh, even more fascinating was I heard of um, dogs and rats being <clears throat> uh, being trained, but not bees. Yeah. Uh, as to how they managed to train bees, I have no idea. Uh, then, of course, you went on to uh, using a, um, a wheeled rover system in conjunction with airborne detection in order to try and uh, uh, neutralize these uh, mines or uh, make certain of the detection and the, for me one of the f uh, most uh, fascinating parts is the uh, uh, the, uh, the teaching and the training of uh, the uh, people in the uh, locality to be able to use this the, these systems I think that's that's an absolutely key part of uh, the future landmine clearance uh, becoming an effective yeah uh, making it very effective uh, and of course uh, the are uh, as I sort of uh, you mentioned, all the systems and the future systems you're thinking of, uh, not only airborne uh, ground uh, penetrating radar, uh, but also uh, magnetometers and uh, uh, chemical analyzers to uh, sniff for unusual gases. Uh, I think you, the the work that you're doing is uh, coming pretty close to anti-submarine warfare, where they it, it's it's literally out of this world. Uh, well, Darren, uh, thank you very much indeed for an absolutely splendid um, and educational and the most enjoyable uh, afternoon and I should say early evening. Mm -hmm. So uh, on behalf of all those who have attended this uh, presentation, many thanks indeed. And uh, uh, I would like to give a virtual applause on the behalf of uh, all members of the audience. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. And I just Thanks uh, very much, Darren. Superb work. Thank you. Uh, fascinating, that. So, no. um, yeah, uh, thanks to Rai for wrapping it up and uh, summarizing key events through the presentation. Um,
yeah, I, I'm definitely going to have a think about what we can uh, do to help you out. I'll, I'll be thinking about that all night now to try and <laughs> suss out how to. I think you've got it sussed on locating the mines, uh, maybe how to disengage the mines. I think that's the next step, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, everybody out yeah. there, you have a think about it, how you can do it. <laughs> so, yeah, um, thanks for attending, everybody. Uh, I, I, I hope you've enjoyed it tonight. And, um, yeah, keep in touch. Uh, keep looking on the Near You website. Uh, I'm a key Near You. Um, I'm sure we'll have some lots of interesting subjects coming up uh, that you'll be able to tune into. Okay, and thanks, everybody. Okay, thanks Thank very much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Ian.